Life to Legacy Explained free virtual series about healthy and happy aging continues with Living in Place Part 3. Learn about products and services that can help you maintain your independence and find out how to retrofit your home so you can continue to live in comfort. Arm yourself with the vital information you need to make your longer life a better life. Brought to you in part by the Chip Reverse Mortgage by Home Equity Bank. Good morning and welcome to episode two of the Life to Legacy Explained series. I'm Natasha Ray, live from Zoomer Hall in Toronto. Today on the program, we'll be discussing living in place with the concept that we should be able to age in safety and comfort and have access to products and services that maintain our independence long after retirement. A Canadian study recently suggested that 22% of older adults who had transitioned into nursing home care could have stayed in home with the appropriate supports in place. Living in place has physical, financial and mental health benefits, so let's dig in. Technology adoption and use have increased tremendously, with 44% of those 50 and older more comfortable with technology now than before the pandemic. Our first guest is Michael Krasowski, the Senior Manager of Business Development and Industry Relations for AgeWell, a Canadian research and innovation network focused on developing technology and services for healthy aging. Nice to see you, Michael. See you too, Natasha. Thanks for having me. So what do you see as the biggest advancements in technology that will allow us to age in place? I'm actually really excited for when I retire because I feel like my house will just do everything for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully with any luck it will. Uh, yeah, you know, I think from the, from the high tech side, not surprisingly, a lot of the pieces around smart homes, sensors that could be in the home, you know, we're seeing research done on technologies that can be placed under a mattress to help you know whether your sleep is good, if there are any potential health issues. Uh, we're seeing things around lighting, better lighting and smart lighting in the house, uh, sensors around the kitchen to detect if there are any issues um, with the stove or otherwise. And I think the, the biggest piece around all of that is how we're going to use that data and those sensors to be more proactive and predictive. So we're seeing research by our scientific director, for example, who is looking at how activities of daily living that those sensors capture might predict risks of dementia or maybe risk of falls and things like that. So I think really it's, it's how we're going to use that data from all those exciting technologies. That's, that's the big thing coming up. Yeah, that's, that's actually really exciting. We, we hear about smart tech a lot and we're already using it. I mean, we're all like, hey Siri, tell me what the weather is outside. Can you talk a little bit more about those smart home systems for aging in place? So you talked about the device under the mattress and I'm hoping one day there's a device that will tell me if I have left my stove on. Because I've, I've never done that, but in my head one day I will leave my stove on and go and get a coffee at Starbucks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think you know you could you could probably split those in different ways. And there's a lot of technology that's smart home technology, voice technology for the home that's designed for for anyone. And the use case for someone who is aging could be, for example, to increase your independence and autonomy using things like uh, Alexa to um, help you get more information about um, whether it's services you may want or it's in some cases in the future asking for help or whether it's uh, kind of passive devices in the home that will give you a sense of security and safety because they may detect a fall without being intrusive. We're not talking about cameras, but there are things like even using your Wi-Fi signals in your home to detect movement and, and motion in the home. And like you said, for the kitchen, I mean, yes, you could have a sensor right in a stove, but you can even have uh, heat sensors to see if maybe a, a, a fire has started or if someone has left the stove on for too long, but no one has been in the kitchen just to, to prompt people or, or even to help them feel, like I said, again, more safe in the home. So I think all of that, and again, how, how the data collected from that can be used to uh, even give you a sense of how your health is and if, if maybe your sleep is changing, if any other patterns are changing, but we're gonna see all of that being connected and, and even connected to things like wearable devices that you use. Well, I'm happy you're bringing up wearable devices because I think one of the things that really gives me peace of mind is knowing that my husband has an Apple Watch. And it's not just because I know then he knows when I'm calling him all the time, but also because it's monitoring like his sleep and his heart function and, and all these things. And so can you talk a little bit about wearable tech and what are some of the new products on the marketplace and some of their most promising functions? So I've mentioned the Apple Watch, but I'm sure you know much more than I do. <laughs> Yeah, and, and even within the Apple Watch now, you're, you're looking at things like fall detection even in the watch itself. So you're seeing technologies uh, being able to 
provide you with not just the ability to, to track general health, but even for, for safety and things like that as, as we age. Uh, and even when we talk about wearables, you know, I know we talk about the step counters, heart rate monitors, but we see uh, a company like Vital Tracer out of Ottawa and, and Montreal that uh, we've supported that's looking at things like measuring your blood pressure using a, a smartwatch and other measures. So the more we do of, of that, the more we're able to look at how, how healthily people are aging. Uh, and I guess the other piece I would talk about with wearables is we even think about assistive devices. So for example, there's the Steady 2. It's a glove people can wear. They have hand tremors and it allows them to, to write, you know, to comfortably hold a glass of water and take a drink. So there's also that side of, of wearables that I think is, is important as well. Yeah, and I remember you talking about the glove. Um, so like if someone has Parkinson's, it actually helps with those tremors you were mentioning, which is incredible that we actually now have technology that can help up with those sort of conditions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we look at technology, it's all about how it can be used as a tool to increase uh, your, your ability to feel comfortable, to age in place, and, and just to feel that control over your life and what you want to do. And so I'm going to use the glove again as an example. So is this just something that I'm going to see on a Tom Cruise movie, or is it something that's going to be accessible to the general public? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's an important point. I know with, uh, with AgeWell, we're always talking about co-creation and making sure that all older adults, uh, irrespective of their situation in life, can have input in how technologies are developed. And so, you know, with, with technologies like that, when they start off, I mean, sure, at the earlier stages, they might be more expensive, but the more we see them developing and, and getting in the market and, and better ways of being manufactured, they actually are becoming more affordable. And, you know, the glove is one example, but even if we talk about technologies for hearing, right? I mean, hearing aids are generally expensive, but when you talk about hearables or, or you know, earbuds you can put in now that can help people hear in noisy environments and things like that, they can be a lot more affordable too. So tech can certainly, even when it comes to aging, still be affordable and accessible, but we obviously have a lot more to do to make sure that that happens. And I want to touch a little bit on um, privacy. So we've talked a lot about data. So. I mean, I'm one of, maybe it's the generation I grew up in, but I'm one of those people who are I'm like, they already have my data. There's nothing I can do about it. But I know that's not the average sentiment. And so mm. there is a lot of data that's being collected through this wearable tech and these devices that we will have in our homes. So how can people feel safe and secure? You know, there's that story of like, the fridge is listening to me. I mean, not that I'm that interesting. I don't know what the fridge is going to find interesting about me. But you know, like, what, what is the fear around the privacy and what is the security that we can feel in terms of that data that's being collected? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the elephant in the room even when we talk about all of these exciting technologies in, in the home. I think uh, we've obviously seen that being as a top priority and sometimes a barrier to getting all these uh, cool and interesting innovations in someone's home. But what we are seeing is a, a bigger push for data ownership, data sovereignty, and you know, the person in the home owning their own data. Uh, and obviously, you need all the security around it. You need to know where the data is held. But it's, it's a shift from going towards a big company owning your data and potentially using it to you being the owner of that data and you deciding who gets access to it, whether it's a doctor, a family member, or, or even another service. Uh, I think we're going to see more of that push. And as people become more aware of how that data is used, it'll hopefully increase that comfort, but also keep people um, and companies uh, you know, honest in terms of how the data is being used. Great. And you, you talk a lot about co-creation. And so I know what that means because my background is in community development, but not everyone knows what co-creation means. So can you speak a little bit about how AgeWell is working with older adults um, around research and development and what that actually means? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's probably at the core of how AgeWell operates. You know, we, we fund research and support startups and innovation, but we're really big on making sure that older adults and caregivers who are also supported are, are involved from the very beginning. So they're able to give their input on what are the main needs, uh, how should this technology serve those needs, and not just looking at people as you know, testing a product after it's done, but having them there along the way. So we do that in the projects we fund, but also with the startups and companies we work with, we make sure that they engage so that technologies are adopted and used and not just sit on the shelf after they're developed. Amazing. And as, a, as an adult child who does not 
live with my parents any longer. Can you talk about how technology will provide ease of mind? Because I know for me, if my mom is alone at home because my dad's with my brother somewhere, then I'm always worried, like, mm. she doesn't pick up the phone, and then I'll call, like, four times in a row, even though the poor woman's just in the shower. I've kind of turned into what she was like when I was a teenager. <laughs> um, so, like, can you talk a little bit about how technology will provide us with that ease of mind as adult children who love our parents and hope that they're thriving? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, uh, I know we saw a major shift in that throughout the pandemic, people becoming more open to things like uh, telehealth and, and virtual care. But uh, that uh, challenge of adult children of wanting to feel connected, especially in a country as big as ours, where people are often far apart, technology really does have that ability to play a role there. And it's, it's from anything, like I mentioned, some of those sensors in the home, if the, the person living there, the older adult is comfortable, uh, you know, giving access to their children to, for example, get a reminder or a note if something may be amiss, uh, then that's, that's one way to do it. And, and even with things like telehealth, we're seeing companies like care to talk where you can have access to telehealth, but their doctors will also give the children, uh, allow them to become patients. And so it creates more of that circle of care. And I think that circle of care is the other big piece. We're going to see more technology looping in your children, other healthcare providers, again, with buy-in from the older adult to, to feel more connected and supported and, and everyone more informed to give you that peace of mind as, as a child as well. Well, thank you. That gives me peace of mind. Thank you so much, Michael. Clearly, tech advancements are game-changing for living-in-place products, and driving much of that change is artificial intelligence. As the head of partnerships and sales at Marketech, Alan Brown is bringing innovative healthcare solutions and cutting-edge products to market that leverage the latest technology, including AI. Welcome, Alan. Hey, thank you. It's nice to meet you in person. Nice to meet you as well. <laughs> so let's start with the defining question. So we're all hearing about artificial intelligence. What exactly is it? <laughs> Well, it's, in a nutshell. Uh, yeah, in a, in a nutshell. Well, it's been around for a long time. But, um, you know, really since December, it has e exploded, if you will. Yeah. And a number of uh, AI uh, programs have come out. And what it's doing is it's making uh, a difference in many, many areas. It's shortening the time someone has to spend doing things. It's giving new ideas. It's allowing the opportunity to test models, um, and just really change how we've looked at how we can, in, in this instance, how we can help people, help uh, institutions like hospitals and things of that nature. So it's got a lot of possibilities and even more than we can even dream of right now. And we've talked a little bit um, with Michael about emerging tools that are more than just reactive. So they're more proactive and yes. they can help manage the frailty of an individual rather just re re um, react to an emergency event. So can you speak a little bit to this? Because I know you have some products as well that are along this path. Right, well our, our main uh, solution is called Sensites and our website is sensites.ai. Um, and essentially, you know, you're focusing on um, remote patient monitoring and Yes, it's reactive, and our, our parent company is called Markitech, where we do AI projects in healthcare and tech. And that's where we really get to focus on the predictive part. So we work on opportunities, solutions, where you can predict when someone might fall. And it's great to have um, those, those tools that can tell you when someone's fallen, but if you can start to see how someone's pattern in walking's changed, how um, they, how many times they get up or down or how fast they are doing those things, that begins to give you a chance to see that there could be a problem with someone and they could be up for a fall soon. So those are some of the things you can use AI for, predictive. So we're working on that. We're also working on diabetes. Imagine being able to, to use a model that's going to say you are headed towards having diabetes. And so we're working on models that can start to predict when someone might, you know, uh, get into that range of uh, high glucose and they can make some changes perhaps before they get there. Well, that's exciting and a little terrifying as mm. well. I mean, I'm sure we're all a little terrified about what AI can do as well. Um, when you speak about fall detection, so, I mean, we're, you're, what you're really saying is we're moving beyond, like, the watch that tells us we've fallen. So can you give us a little bit more detail about how that actually works? Because when we spoke earlier, yes. you had mentioned 
there's these like devices you put on the wall and like me as the adult child, I would know if someone had fallen, yes. even if they weren't wearing their watch, so. Right, for sure. So part of our remote patient monitoring solution where you can check vitals of someone uh, is also you can passively um, help them with falling. So what I mean by that is without wearing a pendant around your neck or a watch, we've, we've instituted a, a device on a wall that uses radio frequency. So you put it in a bedroom, a kitchen, a bathroom, a family room, and it can tell if someone has fallen. So it, it's out of their mind, so to speak. They don't know it's there after a while, which is kind of nice. Um, and you fall and an alert goes to all the caregivers that are on our platform. So that could be a primary nurse practitioner, but it could also be family members. So if you had a father here in Ontario and he fell, you would know in Vancouver mm -hmm. uh, if he's fallen. And it can also do things such as tell how many times you've gotten out of bed during the night. So if typically you get out of bed once or twice a night and that changes to five or six or seven times, it allows a caregiver to say, is everything okay? Are you feeling well? You know, we notice things are, are different. So it's nice to have it on the wall, off, off your wrist, off your neck, and uh, you just walk and just you know, life is normal in, in the home, so to speak. Yeah, I was reading an article about um, a gentleman who had been working with his dad to put different assistive devices in the home, and the way he put it was like it just sort of melted into his life, yes. which I think is the yeah. best way of, of looking at it. I think that's a great it. way of putting it, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Because I know I had an Apple Watch, and I have no idea where it is now, so clearly it didn't work very well with me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, I, and I've, I've talked a little bit about this tongue in cheek, but as we see more and more advancements with, with AI, um, are the fears about breaches and, and robots taking over um, substantiated? Like, is this, I'm sure you've been reading a lot of articles about the AI robot fell in love with this journalist who was talking to them, and is she gonna like cut the brakes in the wife's car? You know, like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not asking you if that's particularly gonna happen, but are these fears substantiated? You know, I think it's, I'm in the same boat as everybody else. No doubt AI, we were talking before we came on, there, there's new, new AI models coming out all the time that can do different things. It, it's exciting, but it is a little bit nerve wracking in a sense, like how intrusive this is gonna be? Am I gonna be watched all the time? So I think as it evolves, there's gonna be, um, you know, regulations that are gonna come around it and how far it can go. You know, we want to use it for things that we can, can be helpful to us, especially if you're aging in the home. How can that make a difference to, to that person, their family, their caregiving team? Those are good benefits, and there's many other good benefits. But you're right, we have to be mindful of how far we allow AI into society. And I, I, I would think that smarter heads will prevail and we'll have a moment where we, you know, we set standards. Mm -hmm and where it stops and, you know, and what the benefits and, the, and the, uh, the cons are and make good choices in the future. We've got to hope that human beings will make good choices that oh. work out for all of us. That's what we're hoping? Yes. That human beings will make the right choices? Oh, yeah. no, Alan, I'm worried we're now. We're all in the same boat, <laughs> yeah. So what advice um, would you have for folks who may be looking at starting to bring in AI-assisted technology into their home? So, you know, for a lot of us, it's, it is new because, as you said, like, it really wasn't at the top of our minds until December, which really wasn't that long ago. Yeah. So what advice do you have? Well, I mean, obviously, you always, you always take a look at things, you ask questions, you, you know, where's the data held? You know, you ask the, the questions that are going to matter to you. For instance, we've integrated a, a um, solution into our platform called Hey Abby. Mm -hmm. And Hey Abby is all about making life easier for people who may not be familiar with tech, may not be familiar with how to use a, a mobile phone. So it's on a tablet. And it, you we're all familiar with Siri, Hey Siri. But we've, we've put medical language in here. So just it can say, Hey Abby, I'm not feeling well. And then Abby will respond to you and ask questions. So it can you know, lead to a conclusion, hopefully, on what should be done. So those are good things for, for everybody. You know, and it makes life easier. You don't have to go onto a keyboard. You can just talk to this AI um, solution that can lead you in the right direction and tell you what to do.
Those are good things. So, but you don't just blindly take it. None of us should blindly take on anything. We should ask questions. If we don't know some, anyone in our family knows the answers, then there's lots of places to go for answers, I think. And how about cost? Because to me, this all sounds great and I want to sign up right away, but is this something that's going to be accessible or is it sort of just for the luxury market right now? I don't think it's for the luxury market at all. Okay. And if you go down to the base level where with our remote patient monitoring platform that integrates some of these tools, it's all definitely affordable. And now I know a lot of AI models have a lot of what you call free versions or light versions that do more than we would ever thought of. I believe there's premium prices as time goes on, but AI is gonna be, there's enough AI around for people to use and use for their well-being and care of others. So my last question, and this is going to be, it kind of does go back to my previous question. In a perfect world, what do you see as the best case scenario for how AI can help us with living in place? And then on the flip side, because I'm a bit of a um, fatalist, what do you see as the worst case scenario, which could be robots taking over the world? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think we're all afraid of that, and we've all watched the movies that, <laughs> yes. that scare us. So, um, But the, the best side is it, it can make things can make life easier. Mm -hmm. Like, as time goes on, medicine has gotten better, right? So people are living longer because of the medicine that's out there. So AI is doing things like that. For instance, we're working on an AI model that allows a conversation between a doctor and a patient. Imagine just going in, and it's a, a pretty important conversation. And you go home, and you speak to someone in your home, and they go, well, how'd it go? and essentially you remember 25, 50% of it. Right. So using AI, imagine grabbing that whole conversation and then summarizing it in a language that makes sense to you as a patient. Before you leave, you get that summary. Mm. And then that summary can be pushed off to their G GP and others. So that's a good thing. You know, you actually know what the doctor said, you understand what's going on. And then, you know, you can do that when you're sitting at home and you're having that virtual conversation with a doctor. Right. And then it's all summarized right there for you. So those are some good things for it, for sure. AI is developing, as we said, and we've got to be mindful of how, what the limits are. So, um, you know, who knows what's going to happen in six months. But I think the, the worst case scenario is that it's just... An, an open, open uh, wild west, so to speak, and anyone can do anything they want. We have to be mindful of that. So, unfortunately, probably politics will get involved. Yeah. But uh, if we if we uh, stand up and say we need we need limits, we need regulations, then I think we'll all be okay, and we can use it for the good that it can give us. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. With so many products at our disposal, how do we figure out what's needed? That's where someone like Jim Close steps in. Jim is a trusted voice in the living in place sector through his 30 year involvement with innovative products like the Assist Step. He also currently oversees the HSAFE Canada Education Platform as National Director, which offers training for service providers catering to seniors. Welcome Jim, it's good to see you yeah, again. Yeah, good to see you again. So you've been in the home safety world for a while. What are you most excited about in terms of advances that are supporting aging in place? And I'm sure with all of these advancements, your vantage point over the last 30 years well, has changed a lot. Yeah, it, for sure. And even the first two speakers, you know, I'm, I'm drinking it in as a, everybody else is. You know, certainly this is a age tech sort of platform. Uh, I'm kind of coming from the low tech side of things. But at the same time, there, there has to be a meshing of, of, of the worlds to get these things in place. Well, I'm thinking next time we do an interview with you, you might even have a robot with you. Uh, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe. My robot, is, well, I mentioned, you, you mentioned that you're looking to not leave your stove on. I've, I've got yeah. that in my wife who constantly asks me to shut the barbecue off even right. though we haven't barbecued. Yeah. So. I'm not even allowed near the barbecue. There you go, yeah. there you go. So what's exciting is certainly the age tech side of things. Um, I'm more excited, uh, you know, after 30 years of being, you know, graduating university and going into this world where I had to constantly explain what I do for a living to people at parties or, or family events. Uh, it's become forefront now. If I say I'm in seniors care or aging in place, certainly the pandemic accelerated everything. All this AI talk is accelerating everything. Our healthcare crisis has accelerated. 
and as much as that sounds doomful, it's actually exciting because now it's forefront. Uh, media, events like today, media it's in the media, it's in the politician's mind. Um, so I think the changes and the developments and the research that we see from, from all these people today are actually going to get into our hands. And, and, and that's what kind of what I focus on is trying to get the practical side of things in, into people's homes and, and used. So. And so we know that approximately one third of adults age 65 or older fall in their home each year, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. How should one start to assess their immediate and long-term needs for allowing us or our parents to age safely in place um, at home? Yeah, certainly the, the, that's one of the other terms is falls prevention is a huge, huge topic. I, I would even argue that those numbers are well underreported because mm -hmm. people don't report the fact or near misses is another. Yeah, you know, that, you know, sure. and, and certainly once you fall once, you have the propensity of falling again. So the main uh, concern or it, it, we have gone from people asking us for help post fall to a little bit more of people asking us for help not to fall. So that's kind of changing, but it's still way off. So I think the, the main thing to consider is everyone understand that your body changes, your activity levels change, your, your eyesight changes, your hearing changes, which actually affects your balance, your medications. So all these things have factors which affect the, the possibility of falling. So we want to be prepared for it. So don't deny it. Don't uh, you know, kind of accept it. Uh, you don't have to fear it, but you have to prepare for it. So. I think you said assessment, so bringing in a healthcare professional even before you do anything to, to assess your home, and that's what we do at, at Age Safe. Age Safe is essentially a, a safety checklist that includes some fall prevention ideas, uh, working in collaboration with healthcare professionals like your occupational therapists, which last year we talked a lot about, um, a very key element of, of an assessment, and, and then outlying, you know, it's basically a risk mediation uh, uh, service to, to point out things that you might otherwise not know about or you know about and you're ignoring is another key thing. Right. And, and what do you see as the biggest mistake that people make when they first start to look to change their home to allow for this aging in place? Okay, so, it, so if they've gone beyond denial and they've accepted it, what's basically not reaching out for help or planning or, or adopting some some suggestions. Um, I've lived it through this past year with my mother-in-law, who I, even I couldn't convince to do some things. So, you know, it became a, a, a move versus staying in place. So, you know, everyone's different. Everyone's uh, lifestyle pattern changes over time and activity levels. So, the mistake made is 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 ignoring help. Reach out for the help. There's there's lots of help available. Even if it's not uh, through the prop, I'm not going to say proper channels. That's not that's not the right word. Through healthcare channels, there's also support groups within communities. Most communities have an age-friendly uh, uh, committee or accessibility committee or senior support mechanisms that can help identify. And then when the help is offered, you know, take it to heart. Um, it's it's not meant to uh, inhibit your your life. It's meant to actually enhance it and and keep you safe. And you talk a little bit about this denial piece. And so how can as um, adult children work with our parents who are maybe like, nope, I don't need any of this. I'm good. I'm fine taking 10 minutes to come up and down the stairs. Like how do we, you know, help with the denial piece? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, I was just speaking earlier today with a staff member here who's going through it as well. Um, you know, it, it, is a, it is a difficult, uh, could be a difficult conversation if, if there is uh, pushback. Um, but you know, the, and, and you don't want to use fear tactics because if fear tactics, you know, then become fearful for everything in your home. Uh, you know, there's certain key places, obviously the stairs and bathrooms, where there's more risks to fall. But you don't want to use fear. You want you want to try to use logic, and you want to try to press upon the importance of re retaining their activity. Uh, a fall dramatically reduces your activity. The first one it leads could lead to a second one, and then ultimately. You know the decision to, to remain at home is taken away from you because you've 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 damaged your body too much. So it's a tough one, but it's you know the age tech side of monitoring and the devices to reduce uh, is all there. They got to accept it. You you have to accept. 
And you remind me of one of the guests on our last show who really spoke about that quality of life piece. So it's really about framing the conversation to be more around how do we keep your quality of life? Yeah. And so I yeah. think that's the important piece there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And we know that aging in, place, aging in place products come in all shapes and sizes. So what do you think is the smartest investment? So, you know, for some people, budget is an issue. So how do we, like, what are the best investment pieces that one can have for aging in place? Well, I think it, I think it goes back to to the previous question of of you know, what, what do you what do you need to do? Uh, I mean, that's a number one question when we talk to senior groups is is what what do I need to do? I really don't know, uh, and who can help me? So you 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 could go completely overboard, uh, but most people don't have that budget. I know we'll talk about budget in a second, but um, you want to basically do the key things that are going to keep you safe uh, in the immediate future with a little foresight into the next future. So, you know, it's all budget dependent and, and that's the sad part about things, but it's also goes back to the original opening statement, which is there's more eyes on this. Yeah. You know, what I would like to see is more funding pushed through the health, home care sector versus institutional care so that, you know, budget kind of gets reduced so that we have a greater choice of what we can put into our homes, including tech, including low tech modifications and, and do it uh, more feasibly for people. I'm not sure if that answered the question. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm trying to get to kind of like the tangibles. So if like, what are, does it make sense to start putting in railings? So I think of my home, like I live in sort of a weird farmhouse that has like four different levels and lots sure. of stairs yeah. and you know, my, Husband just turned 50 and you know, he's, he's aging great, like knock on wood, thankfully, but you know, like say the. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I said he's aging great. I didn't say he's old, okay? okay I know this is live. Yeah. He's gonna, but like, what are some of the things that we can start there, thinking there, there about? There is a formula and pattern, obviously, like yeah. we mentioned, like there's stairs, and there's baths, and there's entrances that, that are the key out things to look at when you're, when, when you're talking about false prevention. Uh, I think it was mentioned earlier with Michael's talk about lighting. Um, you know, things going up and down the stairs. Uh, there is a movement with our assist step product that we're bringing in from Norway. So Scandinavian countries in, in particular are really focused and probably 10 years ahead of us when it comes to research and design of aging in place products. So the assist step was developed to retain your uh, mobility on the stairs without uh, sort of deferring to a passive lift type of device. Right. So. The research there is you know, obviously the more active, more active you are, uh, you you retain your balance, you you, you live a healthier uh, lifestyle. So, all things around, even grab bars mm -hmm. and that are still maintaining your your activity because you're you're climbing in and out of things, but you're using it as a handhold. It, it and the, there has been a big push from manufacturers. It's it's slowly grasping, like like we said earlier, that they are designing products to look nicer. It, it is a big deal that people don't want their homes to look like hospitals. And that's, you know, that's an age old issue. Yeah. Um, and we'll probably get there much like we talked about tech, you know, everything tech rolling into simple usable devices. Eventually we want to do modifications to homes that are invisible, that you don't necessarily know them. Yeah. And, and that's, that's another uh, push for new home builds uh, under universal design. So, um, you know, kind of uh, having the home pre-made to accept some of these devices that become invisible. Right, and that's a very smart point. Um, it, although I am kind of excited about the stair lift only for the fact that I have visions of putting my cat in it and then watching him go up. <laughs> that's that's really Keep it. Keep your cat active. Yeah, he, he needs yeah. to be active, yeah. but sometimes he just wants to I ride. I he's quite large. He? He's not very large, um, okay. Jim. Right, that is on. very judgy of you. <laughs> well, if he needs a stair lift. But. <laughs> So paying for things is always top of mind with myself and our, and our audience. So what sort, and this is tax time, so what sort of tax write-offs or bursaries exist if you need major investments or renovations for aging in place in your home? Yeah, the unfortunate thing is really there's only one uh, federal tax uh, credit uh, for uh, modifying your home now. Uh, there used to be provincial ones in Ontario that's been taken away in the last budget. So, I, 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 you know, there may come, it may come back. So... Again, going back to my earlier comments, you know, I'm, I'm more excited that the politicians are realizing that uh, aging at home, healthcare at home is the way that we have to go. Going back to our Scandinavian countries, they've been doing it for years. 
uh, you know, the, 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 the pressure and financial pressure on their healthcare systems is a lot less because of it. We have to take that information and make it happen here. So uh, I know our, our good friends at CHIP are going to talk about how you, you know, assessing how you're going to pay for it. That's probably, you know, one of the most used tools that we see clients doing, especially when they get into some of the larger modifications of homes, which, you know, can, can, can be costly, um, without a doubt. Uh, but there is no real solid grant programs. Uh, there are the March of Dimes program in Ontario. There's programs in Alberta and BC. There is the RAP program through CH CMHC. Uh, but very little funds come through. It's very capped. So a lot of times people do have to go out of pocket for the renovation. So they, again, it goes back to they have to know where they have to go, uh, what they have to do to, to make uh, that stretch their dollar to make sure uh, the initial modifications and maybe over time they can add to, to, the, uh, to the plan. Great, thank you. Well, thank you so much. That was very helpful. And I will apologize to my cat on behalf of you. So thank you, Jim. Sorry, sorry cat. <laughs> Let's shift the focus now from products to services. The pandemic has really broadened the scope of what you can get delivered, including important healthcare items. According to a survey from PricewaterhouseCoopers Health Research Institute, consumers 65 and older accounted for the largest share of virtual healthcare users during the early months of the pandemic. I'm now joined by Andy Don. Donald. Andy is a certified geriatric pharmacist and founder and president of the Health Depot Pharmacy, Canada's only clinical pharmacy. Welcome. Canada's only online clin clinical <laughs> pharmacy. So you were like, that's incorrect. <laughs> Thank you for joining me, Andy. It's good to see you again. Great to be here, Natasha. So my first question for you is what new services are here to help us age in place when it comes specifically to our health and medication needs? Absolutely. So there's lots of new services, but probably the most important one is the need to personalize medications. And as in Canada, we have a big medication overuse problem, especially particular as we get older, that we're taking too many meds. Some seniors are taking a whole mitful at this point, but also we're taking often the wrong types of medications because uh, believe it or not, a third, a quick stat, third of se all senior hospital visits over the age of 65 are directly due to them taking one inappropriate medication that they shouldn't be on, oh, where wow. there's a much safer alternative that can be used to treat the same condition. Um, and believe it or not, 31% of seniors are currently taking one of those medications every single day. Wow. So it's, it's, there's a big problem, but what exists, and that has to do a lot, what's exciting with the topic today about technology, is because our healthcare system has been very siloed for a long time. Uh, you see doctors, I grew up in a big doctor family, Doctors and pharmacists uh, both go to school for four years. Doctors spend the majority of their time on the most important part of healthcare is knowing what's wrong with you, but on diagnosing you and then do healthcare procedures is mostly what they learn. Whereas pharmacists, the opposite, we spend most of our time on medications. But yet when we get into the community for years now, doctors have, uh, they've been responsible for doing everything, even picking the medication and monitoring the safety of your medications and pharmacists kind of been on the outside looking in. But with technology now, access to e-health, access to, um, you know, blood work, uh, records, and all that kind of stuff. Pharmacists can work directly with your doctor to help personalize the medication, the doses that you should be on based on your kidney function, things like that. It's really exciting. So the Health Depot puts a big emphasis, and you and I have talked a lot about this, on deprescribing and on preventing serious drug side effects like that one-third who are ending up in hospital because of that inappropriate drug use. So can you speak to how, as a pharmacist, you work with doctors to keep a close eye on patients' progress and, and results and making sure that they're only taking the medications that they need? Absolutely. So, I mean, the center of the care is the, is the patient, right? So it's, it's communicating with them and seeing how they feel. Often seen like side effects. We talked uh, just recently about falls. Uh, that is directly due sometimes to the wrong medication, the wrong doses. Talking to the patient first, finding out how they're feeling. If they're dizzy all the time, maybe that's too high a dose. Looking into their blood work and then communicating that to the doctors. There's great tools now for even, instead of just archaically faxing doctors, that we can even text message from our software to their software. A uh, little recommendation, we can say, hey, Dr. So-and-so, we wanted to lower the patient's medication from 100 milligrams to 25 milligrams because their kidney function's this. We give them a number, and you know, this is becoming high and making them dizzy and fall over. And the doctor's like, oh my God, that's amazing. And they can like just send that back. It's, it's really helping to link us, and doctors love it, that we can utilize the technology to communicate much easier and much safer encrypted messaging back and forth to each other. Absolutely. And so 
I know um, for me, I have no desire to go to my doctor's office. I love that my doctor calls me um, like for prescriptions, not on the regular. My doctor doesn't call me but, you know, for <laughs> yeah. like prescription renewals and whatnot. But I know it's a learning curve for a lot of people and a lot of generations. And I know even with my parents, they plan like two weeks in advance. Like here's a doctor's appointment. Who's going to drive? Who's, uh, who's going to sit in the car so we don't have to pay for parking? All these things. So can you speak a little bit about why connecting with a pharmacist or doctor online is just as effective as connecting with them in person? And, and also, when should you go in person? Yeah, absolutely. So with doctors, obviously, I think they said there's a stat that says over 90% of doctor visits could be virtual right nowadays. Uh, if you need, obviously, your doctor to see something, a physical, of course, that has to be in person, right? But for the majority of visits, you're right. Like, sometimes with specialists, uh, for to see a cardiologist, you might have to travel two hours there for a two minute drill visit and out the door and then two hours back home where you can do that quickly on, on a virtual call. And as we discussed also with Alan with AI and documentation that you know there's so much technologies for even collaboration that they can annotate what was discussed and the recommendations and that can be easily and safely shared with doctors but also pharmacists as part of your team to make sure you're getting the best care possible. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really exciting, yeah. Yeah, and I always think um, just in terms of that AI being able to keep those physicians notes so we know what happens during the visit. Like we have this joke in my family because my dad always comes home from the doctor and we say, what did the doctor say? And he said, you're too healthy. And I said, I don't think doctors say that. That's not how that works. And then we joke that he went to Canadian Tire instead of going to the doctors. Um, so like <laughs> at least I, and I am getting at a question. And the question is um, beyond the AI, like what other healthcare advances exist for caregivers, adult children to have people of mind so that if I do live further away from my parents I know exactly what happened in the doctor's visit is are they taking their medications you know all of that so what exists to help me with that absolutely so um, instead of the old pen and paper era where you get your your med list it's all written in paper and you just get that receipt from the pharmacy having it in a secure cloud now makes it easier to share the right um, permissions can be shared out that you know caregivers uh, children with the right permissions, right? All healthcare information is very confidential and very uh, kept very carefully. But with the right permission, that can be shared with the kids uh, so they can see and they can see doctor's progression notes and whatnot going forward, which is really exciting. So it really uh, shortens the barrier um, on, on the know and the, and the worry. And even uh, for ourselves at our pharmacy, we have the ability to share that caregivers can actually select the medications for their parents and see them physically on their phone with the right permissions. And that's gonna be commonplace going forward, that uh, that virtual uh, platform uh, for everyone with their healthcare needs will be very easily shared to, in order to um, optimize and personalize, but also to, sh uh, to, yeah, with all family members, yeah. And with devices like Apple Watch and wearable tech that shows like heart rates and sleep rates, like, or is this information and data that, physicians and pharmacists actually look about? Like, do you find that data to be significant and meaningful or is it just not? Um, yeah, so I def certainly, um, you know, some of it for sure. So, you know, your sleep patterns can tell how much quality sleep you're getting. Heart rate, obviously, for blood, see how your blood pressure meds are doing. Absolutely. If we can get that in an easier to digest format, that'd be, that'd be amazing. And the idea with technology, with AI and whatnot, could help to siphon through all that data for you to give the, the pharmacists, your doctors and your pharmacists a summary uh, to kind of almost flag, you know, where we might need to do an intervention to say, oh shoot, their blood pressure is riding a little high, so we might need to communicate to the doctor and, and try to get their medications tweaked. So in healthcare, we're finding, you know, obviously a crunch that um, as the aging population ages, that the funding has become a little more difficult. And you find that, yeah, you know, there's 20% of Ontarians that don't even have a family doctor. And it's gonna, it might only get worse. So technology can help fill in that gap to make sure we almost have like auto health attendants that can help support both the pharmacists and the doctors to collaborate and make sure you're getting the best possible care. So you've already started to answer my next question, but I'm, <laughs> I wanna know like, how do you think healthcare is going to change as more technical, technological advancements are coming towards us? Like wh what do you hope is going to happen? Absolutely. So it's more like as I, we kind of already like stole the thunder for that, <laughs> but it's like more algorithms and more identification and more following like that your personal health auto like health attendant that monitors your health and 
can give feedback. So you can, it, you can, it can sync with your blood pressure monitor, sync with your blood glucose monitor, transmit that information and notify healthcare professionals when they're reaching thresholds that might need attention. So we can help to prevent serious problems, if, prevent you having to go to the hospital. We're a very reactionary system right now where you have to fall down, break your hip, or have uh, a heart attack, go to the hospital to get that great collaborative care. We need to start doing that ahead of time and prevent you from having those issues in the first place, and that's through early detection. And technology can really help to unlock that, absolutely. So one of my first jobs when I was in university was working as a medical office assistant at a walk-in clinic. So this was quite a while ago, I'm not gonna say how old I am, but I remember what, my first duty was filing and filing hundreds and hundreds of patient files every day. And so that's changing now. We have EMRs and all of these advancements that you've been talking about. So back in the day, I guess your only fear was that someone would break into the clinic, steal your file and read through your medical records. But now, you know, it's changing a little bit because our data is out there on this magical cloud um, with everyone else's data. So what are the safety and privacy concerns? Should we be concerned or can we trust that our healthcare data is being kept safely and securely? Absolutely, so clouds are very secure. They, they encrypt your files and the communication's encrypted. I would argue that the old archaic way of filing it, it, it that's what, why we have healthcare siloing in the first place. And in order to share that information from one clinic to another, you'd have to fax it, which is easier to, uh, to get that information and for it to become more, um, it, it's less secure than even the communication through the cloud. So it's definitely, if we're moving to a system where we, we all are working together, we have to move into the cloud. And so there are some concerns, but the majority of the clouds today are like, they're like Fort Knox, <laughs> like they're very difficult to penetrate and your, your information is very secure and only shared amongst your circle of care, absolutely. Well, that's good to know. I, and I really think we should rebrand the word. I think by calling it cloud, it makes it seem less safe. Yes. So yeah. maybe we should call it vault. Yes. So you and I can work on that rebrand for the world after. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you, Andy. It was so lovely to see you again. It's a pleasure, thanks. We've heard a lot today about products and services for living in place, but the big question at the end of the day is, can I afford it? With over 20 years experience in the financial sector, Vivian Gauchi is the Chief Marketing Officer at Home Equity Bank. She is here to discuss the many financial options that homeowners have for living in place. Welcome, Vivian. Thank you for having me. That pink looks beautiful on you. Oh, thank you. So my first question for you is, what has changed about retirement in the past five years? What new challenges are your clients facing today that they weren't facing previously? Well, so much has changed, right? So we have right now a, a time of inflation, so the cost of everything is going up. And at the same time, we've um, been living longer lives. As we've heard, medical advancements mean that we're healthier, longer. Um, into retirement, we are, you know, being more active. We are very technologically literate, so we're doing a lot of research, we're learning, we're educating ourselves. So what's happening is you have, our lives are getting longer. Um, we've saved money, we've, we've, we've done a good job for the most part. You're speaking for yourself, <laughs> Vivian, you're speaking for yourself. But we, <laughs> for ge generally speaking, yeah. we, we have saved money, but the challenge is the plans that we built years ago, you know, incorporated an average lifespan of, you know, maybe up to 85 years, right? Mm -hmm. That's what financial plans were built on. But the reality is right now, if you're 65, you have a 50-50 chance of living to be 92. So the cost of everything's going up. We saved money, but we may have not saved enough. And so that ends up being a bit of a problem for us in retirement. The good news is we're living longer. Bad news is, you know, we're not 100% sure if we're, we've got the money for it. Yeah, you need to stretch it longer than we would have had to stretch it in the, in the past. And I know one of the first things that people think about as they get older, and you hear about this and see it constantly, is downsizing. But downsizing can be emotionally burdensome and sometimes more costly than you expect. And even as I had mentioned in our last episode, there was a gentleman who was speaking about his mother who was looking at downsizing from her home into a condo. But really, she would have lost her entire community of around her if she had done that. So how do you start to weigh out the pros and cons of should I stay in my home and just put in something to help me age in place or should I be downsizing and moving into another condo yeah, or place? It's not an easy equation. It's uh, There are both hard and, and soft costs is how I like to term it. So in terms of the soft costs, it's absolutely community 
lifestyle, all those things to consider. You've got your memories, a lifetime of memories in your home. Um, this is where you've raised your children. You've had your whole family. Um, you know, so there's there's a very big emotional component to to the house. Never mind the community aspect, right? So, um, you know, one of my team members, for example, talks about her neighbor, and she sees her on a regular basis, checks in on her. She happens to live alone, but she has that sense of community of her next door neighbor, who's always looking out for her. She knows if she's okay or not. You know, they're they're always seeing each other. So there's that con sense of connection. You know, my um, my husband's grandmother when she was still around, she'd go down the street and you know, the pharmacist in the corner knew her name, knew her prescriptions, knew exactly what it is that she needed or was on or, you know, oh, I you know, we noticed that you haven't bought this recently, right? So, so you have this whole aspect that is very, let's call it a soft um, reason why you wouldn't wanna move. Um, and then there's the, the, the harder costs of downsizing and people forget about the fact that you're, you've got commission costs when it comes to real estate agents. Those add up quickly. Land transfer fees, if you live in Toronto, <laughs> you know, those add up. Um, you have moving costs. And oftentimes people forget that you're moving into a smaller place and your furniture isn't going to work. So all of a sudden you're going to have to think about all the new furnishings. And then, of course, you know, rent or whatever it is that you're paying in this new um, in this new home environment, that starts to add up. So you start to think about the, the different costs involved. It's not just about downsizing and then all of a sudden you have access to, these, to this pot of money. It's all the costs that come with it as well. And so staying in the home and community you love has benefits beyond familiarity. So you did talk about some of those other benefits like the pharmacist down the street who knows what medications you're on. Are there any other benefits that you see in terms of aging in place versus going into a facility or downsizing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the reality is when we're young, we envision the home being the, the, an investment and you think of yourself as, okay, I'm here, I've got a mortgage, I'm doing the right things, I'm investing in this great asset, and then when I, it comes time to retire, this is gonna be it, this is gonna be the nest egg. The problem comes when you're actually at that age and all of a sudden we talk about all those things that come into play, the emotions, the fact that you want to stay there, the fact that you're familiar with the house and you don't want to move and you love that house that you've lived in all your life. And so that, that becomes a, a, a very real factor. And so then how do, you, how do you tap into that great asset that you've spent your life building, that you made that very smart investment decision? a long time ago to invest in. How do you do that while still staying in place? It's a bit of having your cake and eating it too, shall we say. Yeah, and so if we've decided to stay put, stay put, many homes are not necessarily fit for our future selves. So let's talk about the most common renos that people need to finance to make their homes safe and accessible. Like if, if I was gonna start with the low hanging fruit, Absolutely. what would that be? Yeah. So, so the number one reason people come to us is because they're usually trying to pay off an existing debt, right? Because they're making monthly payments on whatever existing debt there is. And so even just taking away that monthly payment is a huge relief for a lot of our clients. But the number two reason is home renovations. And so what you see is, for example, we were just talking about falls, and um, we know that a third of, hosp of ER hospital visits are caused by falls, and they're happening in the home. So the reality is, is if you can make some changes in the home, you know, that home that you raise your kids in, and you were, you know, giving the baths to your three and five-year-old at the time, now all of a sudden, that bathtub, not such a great idea, you want to have a new shower put in, well, so you start to think about all those things that you might have to make little adjustments to make the home more livable. Maybe you want some more grab bars, maybe you want, again, a curbless shower, which now looks stunning, right? Um, and, and, it's in, and it's very modern. Um, so it's not even just about making these adaptations to make the home more livable, but it's just even something that you might want to enjoy a little bit, a, a little bit more of. But some some of the other uh, renovations. A curbless shower. It sounds beautiful. It is. It is yeah, right. I'm Google that as soon as we're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so ramps is another popular one. So people like to be able to more easily access uh, the home without having to deal with the stairs all the time. So I've seen that be another popular. Uh, installation. So 
It's a, it's a full list of, of things that people can do to make the home more, more livable, more accessible, and also a little bit more enjoyable for, 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 for your older years. Yeah, and that, I don't know if you heard earlier, I was talking about getting a stair lift for my cat. Yeah. So for me, that would be joy. Absolutely. That's joy for me. <laughs> So, if it sparks joy, right? Yeah, if it sparks joy, yeah. Isn't that what um, Marie Kondo says? There you go. Yeah, it sparks joy. So as Canadians live longer, we don't only need our homes to be accessible, we also will sometimes require in-home health care. Yeah. And this is something that I didn't know, but Home Equity Bank has um, just run the Home Care Hero Awards to support personal support workers. Yeah. And there's a reason that prompted you to, to shine a light on these support workers. So could you speak a little bit about that? Well, we, we started to realize that one of the key elements, if we know that you know nine out of ten people prefer to age in their home we know that eventually you're gonna probably come to a time where you're gonna need a little bit of extra help to stay there and so that's where a personal uh, support worker or a home care aide would come in and fill that gap and sometimes it's as small as coming in once a week helping with some late cleaning some cooking it, you know checking in on you so sometimes it's very light, and then sometimes as, as you know, we age and we progress, we might need somebody coming in on a more frequent basis or for more time. So none of that, though, is necessarily covered by the government. So a lot of times people are coming to us because they need to finance that extra help. They're able to stay in their home where they prefer to be. They're not placing a burden on any type of institutional health care, and they remain independent, so they can stay at home where they want to be, plus having that, that health care person come in and helping them out. But again, the, the, the cost equation is how are you going to finance that? So what we're finding is people are not using uh, this service a lot yet, but they're thinking about the fact that they're going to need to use it. So we're, we're doing some studies and we're seeing that you know about a third of people are saying, okay, I'm probably going to have to think about this in the not too distant future. Um, and about 80% of Canadians are saying, but ooh, I'm not sure how I'm going to afford this, right? Because they start looking into it and they realize, you know, there is some government funding, but it's very limited. It only takes you so far. So people are starting to think about, you know, this is an important, this is an important role that society does need. It helps everybody keep everybody in their home, um, but where's the money going to come from? So that's what, that's what people are struggling with right now. So could you walk me a little bit through that process? So let's say I'm an older adult. I've decided, okay, I want to do some changes to my home. I want to add in some, some railings, and I want to get that cool curbless shower. And then I'm also looking at having some support come once a week. And I fully own my home. So like, how, like walk me through this as if I'm six years old, because I, this is also a learning for me, because I would have no idea. Like, how does it work? Right, so you would probably... Th you would obviously think about the types of renovations that you're trying to make. So maybe it's that curbless shower that you want to install. And so you would potentially come to us and we'd talk to you about, okay, what's your home worth? What's your age? And we tell you, this is how much you would qualify for, for example. So you would say, okay, I, I need about $20,000, $25,000 to make some enhancements in the home. I want to redo my kitchen, I, you know, I need to level out the, these steps here, I don't want to have to have, take these steps every time I want to go down to my living room. So you would make some, do those renovations, and then what you would have is some money that you can take out later on. Some people decide to, you know what, I'm just going to save it for a rainy day, and some people say, no, actually, I'd love to have a monthly draw. So $1,000 a month, for example. So even though you can come to us and you can qualify for, you know, say even $500,000, a lot of people don't take that amount. They take whatever they need, they save the rest for a rainy day, or they take the money over time. And so in that way, they're able to manage, you know, what they're spending, how they're spending. And it's not, you know, it's not a free-for-all, let's call it that. We're Canadians, we're very conservative. And so people don't borrow a lot of money. They borrow just what they need. 
Those are the logical people. I'd be like, give me the 500K. We're going to have a huge party. It's going to be great. <laughs> so in-home care can be expensive, but ultimately it is cheaper to, and healthier to stay in your own community. So how do we um, get over the sticker shock of some of the services and products needed to maintain our independence? And this goes back to even when my conversation with Jim talking about that denial piece. Like, I don't need these things. And then you find out that the Sterilift costs 20000 and it seems astronomical. Like, how... How do you help, how do we help ourselves and people in our lives understand that it's not actually that bad? Well, it, you know, so first you have to assess what it is that you actually need. So we talked about the fact that some people only need somebody coming in once a week and that's good enough for them. And you can look into the cost of those services and they can be quite affordable. Of course, w over time, if you start needing more support, that's where it starts to get a little bit more, um, a burdensome. So one of the ways that you can do it is you can look at all the different options that you have. You can look at downsizing, you can look at getting a home equity line of credit, you can look at a conventional mortgage. There are different options available to you. Um, but if you want to stay in your home, you're going to have to think about, okay, you, you made this great investment decision many years ago, you have this home, how are you going to tap into or access that, that equity in your home? Well you have to consider all your options. And you know with, <laughs> nowadays, one of the options that people tend to recommend is a home equity line of credit. I don't know if you uh, have checked, I don't know if you have a home equity line of credit, but uh, the last time I checked, which was just this morning, I checked as on my way in, I'm paying 6.7% right now oh. on my home equity line of credit. And I was thinking, I'm like, I don't think I have one, and if I, I, I wouldn't even know what the interest rate would be on it because I'm one of those people. Yeah. <laughs> well, I had to check. I, okay. I, I wanted to make sure I checked. And I said, you know, our, our product right now, people assume it's too expensive. So our five-year rates at right now are at 6.89%. Mm -hmm. So that difference isn't that big. And the key difference there is obviously with a home equity line of credit, you're having to make monthly payments. Right. With our product, with Chip Reverse Mortgage, you don't have to worry about making any monthly mortgage payments. And that alone sometimes, I mentioned one of the top reasons people come to us is to pay off existing debt. Well, that alone right there provides a lot of relief for a lot of our clients. And even, I was reading an article recently where um, Home Equity Line was, we were quoted in it, or there was a stat that was quoted that even with the rising interest rates, there still is a, there was like a 30% increase in people who were taking reverse mortgages. Yes. And so can you speak a little bit to why that may be, even with the, the rising interest rates? Well, it's, it all circles back to the need, right? right? So the cost of everything is going up and people are, you know, less certain of what they're going to be able to afford. And sometimes this just provides that security, that peace of mind, to be able to say, okay, I'm gonna be fine because you know you never have to worry about paying off the mortgage until you move or sell. So this gives people a lot of peace of mind to know that they can make it through the next little while. The other, the other side of the equation is we have a lot of people who are, we call them asset rich, cash poor. So it's not just house rich, cash poor, they have, they have investments and they don't wanna break into them because then all of a sudden that creates this very significant tax bill right, with capital gains. So they're trying to figure out, okay, how can they move their money around? And this ends up being a very interesting product for them. And, you know, these are not people that you would say they, they, they have problems making ends meet. It's just that their money is tied up. So the, on, the, on that other side of the spectrum, we have a lot of clients that come to us via financial planners because the financial planner is doing the numbers. They're like, this is an incredible tax savings for you. So there's, there's various different things to consider. And, um, you know, it's not a product that's up for everyone, but it's a product for a lot more people than I think people first um, consider. Well, and the peace of mind is, is so important, especially in the time we're living in. I think having that peace of mind is something that we all kind of need right it now. It helps us sleep at night, it does. definitely. Yeah. So I'm going to move to sort of the advice portion of my interview with you. So what solutions can you tell your, our viewers about that will enable them to age in place? So from technology to, to other things, like what, what do you recommend? What are some of these solutions? <laughs> well, I, I, I loved hearing about um, all your guests' uh, solutions today. I, I, want, to, I want to get them all <laughs> myself. <laughs> uh, but, um, but I think, you know, it's, it's up to you, your comfort level. Like I said, we are 
all becoming a lot more technologically adept. We all have Alexas at home, regardless of age, right? And it's made it's made everything uh, easier. Google Home, Alexa, whatever the case may be, the personal assistant of of, of choice. Um, so it's you know that is a, a bit of a personal preference in terms of what you want at home in terms of technology. The advent of AI is going to be very interesting for, for, for many of us. It's um, you know the fact that you can get some recommendations based on your historic uh, prescription recipes. I think that's incredible. So I, I'm, I'm excited to see what lies ahead in terms of technology. I think you know in terms of having um, uh, uh, help at home, I think that is only going to increase in need and people, again, as people want to stay in their home, this is going to be a perfect way to solve for that extra help that people might need while they're staying at home and they're aging in place. And of course, in terms of financing at all, there's more and more options than ever before if you're looking at, you know, how are you going to, how are you going to pay for all these uh, great uh, benefits and features and enhancements. So. So I was just given my plane read, so yes. I'm flying back to Vancouver today. And so your colleagues, Steve Ranson and Yvonne Zumecki, co-wrote a book called Home Run, The Reverse Mortgage, Ad Mortgage Advantage. So can you tell me a little bit about this book? Absolutely. And why should I read it today on my flight home? Uh, well, it, it, the book is uh, about a lot more than just reverse mortgages. It really talks about retirement in general, what's been happening with Canadians, how they've been dealing with all of the recent developments that we've been talking about today, for example, how we're different today than we were um, many years ago. And it does talk a lot about those scenarios and the stories of customers who have actually come to us and why they've come to us and looking at their financial situation when they came to us, after they came to us. One of my favorite stories in the book is the story, you know, it, it's actually one of our, our top sales people. Um, and she talks about her mom and her parents. And, and what she says is, you know, they, they made the decision and they came to us kids, so she's one of four siblings. They came to us kids and they said, you know what, it's time, we're ready, we're gonna downsize. And it was now about 20 years ago, but when she first was telling the story, it was about 15 years ago. And, um, and, and she said, you know, and we were all like, perfect, this is great, good for you. You've worked hard all your lives, and this was always the plan. You're going to downsize. So they downsized, and they moved into their home. 15 years fast forward, and um, unfortunately, they actually downsized, and they started renting. And um, well, 15 years forward, they're still living their lives. Now they're having health care um, concerns, but the money's gone. Mm. They sold their home. Their, their home um, was in Oakville. It was meant like a like I said, twenty something odd years ago. Now, they sold it for about three hundred ninety-five thousand dollars at the time. Um, but what happened is, you fast forward fifteen years, and the house is now worth two million dollars. So, had they you know looked at other options at that time, mm -hmm. they would still have had that asset that kept appreciating over time, and they wouldn't necessarily be having to rely on their kids to now support them. So, you know, she's, she's our top salesperson because she basically says, I'm just going to give you all the facts and you go, you're going to make the decision, right? It's all up to you. But then she tells them the story and then people start to think about, oh, yeah, this is an asset. You know, this is something that conti will continue to appreciate long term over time. I know right now we're in a different situation, but long term over time, you know, the housing market tends to appreciate. It's something that over time will continue to appreciate. And so if you decide to sell it right now, you know, you could be losing out on future appreciation. So it's just a, a, an one, just one of the yeah. very interesting stories in the book that kind of help paint a picture as to, you know, why people um, could consider the product, but also just about their overall, how they're leading their retirement lives in general.
Well, yeah, I mean, you sold me, so I'm going to read this for sure. And and you're offering a free copy to our in-studio audience and Everybody, our viewers yes. online. So Everybody why you... in the studio will get a copy. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you tell us how people who are online can access their free copy? Absolutely. So um, I think we have a, a 1-800 yeah, number. Yeah, it should be that showing on can... the screen. You okay. and I can't see it, but <laughs> they can see it. <laughs> Wonderful. So they can call... Our, uh, our call center uh, people are on the line. They're, um, they're excited to speak to you. Um, and they've been handing out copies of the book for, for a while now. Okay. Um, and, and I'm telling you, people take the book away, they read it, and then they come back and they tell us about what story in there they liked or what story resonated with mm -hmm. them, you know, why they identified with the people in the book, because it really is about you know, living l retirement in general, and you know, it's 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 just about everyday people living if, living their retirement lives. And I do have the number here, so if you can't see it um, on the screen, or if you want to write it down, it's one eight three 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 five seven two four four seven. So Wonderful. one eight three 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 five seven two four four seven. And that's how you can get your free copy there of Home go. Run. So and thank. You. Perfect, and that's. That's if you want to get your free copy. If you just want to go online, you can visit chip.ca. We have a financial calculator in there, and you can run your own financial illustrations that tell you, you know, you can put in your age, you can put in your home value, and it can kind of tell you what you can expect over the next um, 10, 15 years, for example, and what your financial, your own personalized financial illustration can look like. Oh, well, that's amazing. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That wraps up today's program. I hope we've been able to shine a spotlight on products and services that will support your ongoing independence. Join us next month on May 25th at the same time for part three in our series, Leaving Your Legacy. Until then, thank you for joining us. Signing off from the Zoomerplex in Toronto, I'm Natasha Ray.